Welcome back to Alexandria, where history meets storytelling in our simplified version of Jacob Abbott's Makers of History series. Today, we present Chapter 5 of the Romulus Saga, an epic chapter brimming with adventure, divine encounters, and the indomitable human spirit. In this chapter, we witness Aeneas, the Trojan hero, amidst the ashes of Troy, his world crumbles around him as he endures loss, battles dangers, and receives guidance from the gods themselves. With his family and the fate of his people on his shoulders, Aeneas forges a path through chaos, leading to the shores of destiny, Italy, where the seeds of Rome are sown. As you join us on this gripping journey, we invite you to become a part of our community. Subscribe to stay updated with our series, give us a like to show your support, and share this video with others who revel in the tales of yore. Your engagement is the cornerstone of Alexandria, helping us to bring history to life for listeners around the world. Now, let's sail forth into Chapter 5 and witness the trials and triumphs of Aeneas and his companions as they lay the groundwork for what will become one of the greatest empires the world has ever seen. Thank you for choosing Alexandria, and enjoy the continuation of our timeless tale. Chapter 5. The Flight of Aeneas, B.C. 1200 Aeneas watched from the nearby battlements as the palace was taken and Priam was killed. He felt hopeless and focused only on finding a way to save himself and his family from the coming destruction. He thought about his father, Anchises, who lived with him in the city and was about the same age as Priam. He also worried about his wife and young son, Ascanius, he feared that the attackers might have reached his home and were possibly looting and destroying it and harming his wife and family. He decided to hurry back home. He looked around to see if any of his companions were still with him, but he was all alone. Some of them had jumped off the battlements and escaped to other parts of the city. Unfortunately, some had fallen while trying to jump and died in the fires below. Others were hit by arrows and fell from the high walls into the street. The Greeks had also left that area of the city. Once the palace was destroyed, there was no reason for them to stay, so they left one group after another, shouting with joy and defiance to find new battles in other parts of the city. Aeneas listened to their voices getting fainter and fainter. In one way or another, everyone had left, and Aeneas found himself completely alone. Aeneas managed to safely return to the street carefully choosing his path and staying vigilant against the dangers around him. He cautiously moved through the remains of the palace towards his own home. As he went on, he noticed a woman hiding in the shadows near an altar that he had to pass. It turned out to be Princess Helen. Helen was a princess from Greece. She was previously married to Menelaus, the king of Sparta. However, she ran away from Greece with Paris, the son of Priam, the king of Troy. This elopement was the reason for the Trojan War. At first, Menelaus, accompanied by another Greek leader, went to Troy and asked for Helen to be returned to him. Paris refused to give her back. Menelaus went back to Greece and organized a big expedition to go to Troy and capture the queen. This is how the war started. The people saw Helen as the cause of all their problems, whether she was innocent or guilty, when Aeneas, who was in a very angry mood, saw Helen trying to protect herself from the destruction caused by her actions, he became even angrier and decided to seek revenge by killing her. I will kill her, he thought as he rushed towards her hiding place. It may not be honorable to take vengeance on a woman or to punish her for her crimes, but I will still kill her. I will be praised for this act. After causing ruin to us, she should not escape and return to Greece to become a queen again. As Aeneas said these words, rushing forward at the same time, sword in hand, he was suddenly stopped by his mother, the goddess Aphrodite, who appeared before him. She took his hand, told him to calm down, and reassured him with comforting words. It's not Helen's fault that Troy was destroyed. The gods made it happen, and it can't be changed. Don't waste your time seeking revenge on humans. Instead, 
think about your family. Your father, wife, and son are in danger. While you're here trying to get back at Helen, your loved ones are surrounded by enemies who want to harm them. Go to them and protect them. I'll be with you, even if you can't see me, and I'll keep you and your family safe from any danger. As soon as Aphrodite spoke these words, she disappeared. Aeneas obeyed and headed straight home. As he walked through the streets, he noticed that the armed bands moving around the city mysteriously made way for him. This convinced him that his mother was truly with him, using her supernatural powers to protect him. When he got home, the first person he saw was his father, Anchises. He told Anchises that everything was lost, and the only option left for them was to find safety by fleeing to the mountains behind the city. However, Anchises refused to go. You who are young, he said, and have a future worth preserving, can flee. As for me, I will not try to save what little remains, only to live in miserable exile if I succeed. If the gods intended for me to live longer, they would have spared my hometown, my only home. You can go, but leave me here to die. In these words, Anchises sadly turned away, determined to stay and face the same fate as the city. Aeneas and his wife, Creosa, pleaded with him to leave, but he refused. Aeneas stated that he couldn't abandon his father and would stay with him. If someone died, he said, they would all die together. He put on his armor and decided to go out into the city streets again. He was determined to die while fighting against those who were trying to destroy him. However, he couldn't do it because Crusa stopped him. She fell down in front of him at the door, very scared and desperate. She had her little son, Ascanius, in one arm, and she held her husband's knees with the other. She asked him not to leave them. She said, stay and protect us. Don't go and risk your life. But if you're determined to go, take us with you so we can all die together. The family's conflicting desires and emotions persisted for a while, but eventually, Anchises gave in to the others' wishes, and they all decided to escape. Meanwhile, the chaos and commotion in the city streets were getting closer, and the increasing number of burning buildings showed that they had to act quickly. Aeneas quickly made a plan. His father was too old and weak to go through the city himself. So Aeneas decided to carry him on his shoulders. Little Ascanius would walk beside him. Creusa would follow closely to her husband to avoid getting lost in the dark night or the chaotic scenes they would have to go through. The household servants would escape the city by different routes, each choosing their own, to avoid getting noticed by their enemies. Once outside the gates, they would all meet again at a certain high ground near the city that Aeneas indicated to them using an old abandoned temple and a majestic cypress tree growing there. This plan was immediately executed by the party. Aeneas put a lion's skin on his shoulders to make his father more comfortable, or perhaps to lighten the burden on himself. Anchises took the household gods in his hands. These were sacred images that were customarily kept in every home as a symbol of divine protection. Saving these images, even when everything else was abandoned, was always the ultimate goal of the husband and father. Aeneas, in this case, asked his father to take these pictures, as it would have been wrong for him, having just come from battle and violence, to touch them without first doing some kind of purification ritual. Ascanius held his father's hand. Creusa followed behind. They left the house and walked through the streets, all dark and gloomy, except for the occasional light from the distant fires, which shone in the sky and sometimes reflected on buildings and towers. Aeneas continued to move forward, feeling a mix of excitement and fear. He stayed in the darkest areas, sticking to walls and narrow streets. He worried about the safety of Anchises and Creusa, fearing they might get hit by a stray weapon or ambush from Greeks. He knew that if they were discovered, they would all be killed without mercy. Being burdened with his load, he couldn't defend himself or them effectively. 
The party, however, seemed to avoid all these dangers for a while. But as they were getting closer to the city gate and starting to feel safe, they suddenly heard a loud noise and saw a group of men rushing towards them from nearby streets. The men posed a threat and could easily overpower them. Anchises was very scared when he saw the shining weapons of the Greeks coming closer. He urged Aeneas to run faster or take a different route to avoid the imminent danger. Aeneas was scared by the loud shouts and chaos he heard. The scene made his mind confused for a moment. He quickly ran in different directions, trying to find the best way to escape. Many people were moving in a chaotic manner, which made his escape difficult. Eventually, he managed to find a way out of the city. He kept running without looking back until he reached the designated meeting spot on the hill. There, he gently placed his burden down and looked for Creusa, but she was not there. Aeneas was extremely shocked to discover that his wife was missing. He cried and expressed his sorrow and hopelessness loudly, but then he realized that it was a time to take action instead of just being sad. He quickly hid his father and Ascanius in a hidden valley behind the hill and entrusted them to his servants. After that, he hurried back to the city to search for Creusa. He fully armed himself before leaving, determined to face any danger in his quest to find and rescue his beloved wife. He returned to the same gate he had exited from and re-entered the city. He tried his best to retrace the path he had taken when leaving the city, using the light from the burning buildings as a guide. He continued in this manner, feeling desperate and distressed, looking everywhere but unable to find Creusa. Eventually, he considered the possibility that she might have returned to their home, believing it to be the safest place for her. Therefore, he decided to go there and search for her. This was his final hope, and he was deeply saddened when he arrived at their dwelling and found that she was not there. He discovered his house, and when he got close, it was completely on fire. The nearby buildings were also burning, and the streets were filled with furniture and belongings that the desperate residents had tried to save but failed. These residents were standing around, overwhelmed with sorrow and fear, and looking helplessly at the scene of destruction in front of them. Aeneas quickly saw everything and immediately, in a state of extreme excitement, started calling out Creusa's name. He searched among the people near the fire, desperately asking for any news about her. But it was all in vain. He couldn't find her. Aeneas then wandered through other parts of the city, searching everywhere and asking anyone who seemed friendly if they had seen her. His suspense, however, ended when he suddenly encountered a ghostly vision of Creusa in a secluded area of the city, halting his movement. The apparition was unusually large and appeared in a form that seemed both ethereal and shadowy. The serene and kind expression on its features assured him that this vision was not of our world. Aeneas quickly realized that Creusa's earthly sorrows and sufferings had come to an eternal conclusion. At first, he was shocked and terrified by what he saw, but Creusa tried to comfort him by speaking gently. My dear husband, she said, don't be so anxious and sad. The things that have happened to us didn't happen by chance. They were all planned by a powerful and divine force. It was already decided by the will of heaven that you couldn't take me with you when you fled. I have learned what your future destiny is. You will have a long and tiring journey, both by sea and land, and you will face many challenges, dangers, and tests. However, you will safely overcome them all and eventually find a peaceful and joyful home on the banks of the Tiber. There, you will establish a new kingdom, and a princess is already waiting for you to become your bride. Stop mourning for me. Instead, be glad that I didn't become a captive of our enemies and get taken to Greece as a slave. I am free, so you shouldn't be sad about what happened to me. Goodbye. Love Ascanius for me and take care of him for the rest of your life. After saying these words, the vision started to fade away. Aeneas tried to hold on to the beloved image in his arms, but it was not physical and quickly vanished. 
Before he could say anything, it was gone, leaving him standing alone in the empty and dark street. He eventually turned away and, feeling lonely, deep in thought and sad, he went back to the gate of the city and then to the valley where he had hidden Ancases and his young son. He discovered that they were safe. The entire group then looked for hiding places in the valleys and mountains where they could stay hidden for a few days, while Aeneas and his friends made plans to leave the country completely. These plans were quickly finished. Once the Greeks had left, allowing them to come out of their hiding place without risk, Aeneas had his men build several small boats, equipping them with both sails and oars, as was customary at that time. During the preparations, small groups of Trojans kept joining Aeneas day by day. They came out of their hiding places in the mountains after hearing that the Greeks had left, and Aeneas was gathering the remaining Trojans on the shore. The number of people at Aeneas's camp grew, and as Aeneas expanded his naval preparations to match the increasing number of supporters, he realized that he had a significant naval and military force when he was ready to sail. When the fleet was finally prepared, he loaded provisions onto the ships and boarded his men, bringing along Anchises and Ascanius, of course. Once a favorable wind came up, the expedition began sailing. As the ships slowly moved away, the decks were filled with men and women who sadly looked at the fading shores, knowing that they were saying a final goodbye to their homeland. The closest country reachable from the Trojan coast was Thrace, located to the north of the Aegean Sea and the Propontis. It was separated from the Trojan territories by the Hellespont. Aeneas sailed northward towards Thrace and landed there to establish a settlement. However, he was forced to leave quickly due to a terrifying phenomenon that he witnessed. This prodigy prompted him to hastily depart from those shores. The prodigy was as follows. They set up an altar on the shore when they landed and were getting ready to make the customary sacrifices. Aeneas wanted to shade the altar with branches, so he went to a myrtle bush nearby and started pulling up the green shoots from the ground. He was surprised and horrified to see that blood came out from the roots whenever they were broken. Drops of what looked like human blood would come out of the broken part as he held the shoot in his hand and fall to the ground. He was very scared when he saw this, thinking it was a bad sign. He quickly prayed to the gods of the land, asking them to protect him from whatever bad thing the sign meant, or at least tell him what it meant. After praying, he tried to pull another myrtle stem from the ground to see if anything had changed. At that moment, though, when the roots started to give way, he heard a groan coming from the ground below, like someone in pain. Right after that, a voice in a sad and eerie tone started to ask him to leave and stop disturbing the rest of the dead. What you're tearing and hurting, said the voice, is not a tree, but a person. I am Polydorus. I was killed by the king of Thrace, and instead of being buried, I've been transformed into a myrtle tree growing on the shore. Polydorus was a prince from Troy. He was the youngest son of Priam and had been sent to Thrace to grow up in the Thracian king's court. He had been given a lot of money and treasure when he left Troy so that he would have everything he needed and could maintain his status as a prince while he was away from home. His treasures, though they were given to him by his father as a means of support and protection, ended up causing his downfall. When the Thracian king realized that the war was not going well for the Trojans, and that Priam, the father, had been killed and the city destroyed, he killed the defenseless son to take his gold. Aeneas and his friends were surprised to hear this story and quickly realized that Thrace was not a safe place for them. They decided to leave the coast and search for better opportunities elsewhere. However, before leaving, they performed the necessary funeral rites for Polydorus in a private and solemn manner as was customary at that time. Once these sad rituals were completed, they returned to their ships and sailed away. After that, Aeneas and his party spent several months traveling from one island to another and from one shore to another, facing numerous challenges and dangers. They also had many unusual and romantic adventures. 
At one point, they were mistakenly led to believe that they should settle in Crete, a beautiful island located south of the Aegean Sea. They had asked a sacred oracle, located at a special place they visited during their journey, southward through the Aegean Sea, to guide them in finding a permanent home. The oracle responded by telling them to go back to the land where their ancestors originated from before they settled in Troy. Aeneas asked Anchises to tell him the name of the land they were in. Anchises thought it was Crete. He mentioned that there was an old belief that some important men from their Trojan ancestors came from Crete. Therefore, he assumed that this was the land mentioned by the oracle. The fleet sailed south and reached Crete. They settled there, building a city, cultivating fields, and constructing houses. Unfortunately, their hopes for peace and safety were shattered when a terrible disease spread among them. Many people died. Others who survived were extremely weak and moved around slowly, looking very thin and miserable. It was a pitiful sight to see. To make matters worse, there was a severe drought. The crops they had planted dried up and died in the fields. So, on top of the terrible disease, they now faced the even greater fear of famine. They were in great distress and had no idea what to do. In this difficult situation, Anchises suggested that they should go back to the oracle and ask for more details about the meaning of the previous response. They wanted to make sure if they had misunderstood it and settled in the wrong place. Or if that wasn't the case, they wanted to find out what other mistake or fault had angered the gods and brought such terrible punishments upon them. Aeneas agreed with this suggestion, but he couldn't do it because of the following incident. One night, he was lying on his couch in his home, unable to sleep due to his worries and thinking about how to solve the difficulties he and his followers were facing. The moonlight came in through the windows, and he saw the household images he had saved from the fire of Troy resting in their shrines on the other side of the room. As he looked at these gods in the quiet and solemn midnight hour, feeling burdened by anxiety and care, one of them started to speak to him. We have been sent, said a divine voice, by Apollo, whose oracle you wish to consult again, to give you the answer you seek without requiring you to return to his temple. It is true that you made a mistake in trying to settle in Crete. This is not the land where you are meant to live. You must leave this place and continue your journey. The land that is meant to welcome you is Italy, a place far away from here, and your path to it crosses vast and rough seas. Do not be discouraged, however, because of this, or because of the troubles that are coming your way. You will succeed in the end. You will safely arrive in Italy, and there you will establish a powerful empire that will eventually expand its rule across many nations. So, have courage and set sail again with a happy and confident heart. You are safe, and everything will work out fine in the end. The discouraged adventurer felt much better after receiving this encouragement. He quickly got ready to follow the instructions given to him by divine communication. The partially constructed city was left behind, and the expedition set sail again. They encountered many different adventures during their journey, but it would be too long to tell all of them in this part of our story. They encountered a storm that lasted for three days and three nights. They were tossed around without any guidance, unable to see the sun or stars. It was a very dangerous situation, as they were at risk of being overwhelmed and destroyed by the huge and terrifying waves. Another time, when they landed on a group of Greek islands to rest and refresh themselves, they were attacked by the harpies. These birds of prey were extremely large, had offensive habits, and were fierce and very hungry. The harpies were famous in many ancient stories as creatures that troubled and annoyed sailors and adventurers who encountered them. Some believed that there were only two or three of these beings, and they even knew their names. And yet, various narrators provided different names for them, including Ailopos, Nikothoia, Osithoia, Osipoe, Seleno, Akoloe, and Aelo. 
Some claimed that the harpies had the appearance of women, while others described them as extremely ugly. However, everyone agrees that they were incredibly ravenous, constantly devouring anything they could reach with their claws. These strong creatures flew down to Aeneas and his group and took away the food from the table in front of them. They even attacked the men. The men then armed themselves with swords in secret and waited for the harpies to come again so they could kill them. However, the quick thieves avoided all their attacks and escaped with their stolen goods, just like before. Eventually, the expedition was forced to leave the island because of these hungry birds. As they were getting on their ships, the leader of the harpies sat on a rock and insulted Aeneas and his companions with harsh words. The expedition spent one night near Mount Etna, feeling terrified and fearful. They witnessed terrifying smoke, flames, and lava erupting from the mountain's summit at midnight. They heard thundering sounds coming from beneath the ground, adding to their fear. They believed that terrible monsters lived beneath the mountains and fueled the fires. All of these experiences filled them with indescribable awe. As soon as morning came, they quickly continued their journey to escape from such a horrifying scene. Once they arrived at a shoreline where there lived a tribe of giants with only one eye. These giants were gigantic and incredibly cruel. They were cannibals, feeding on the flesh of the men they captured. They would grab them with their hands and violently strike them against the rocky walls of their lair. Some men, who were imprisoned by a monster named Polyphemus, managed to blind him while he was sleeping. Although they couldn't kill him because he was huge, Aeneas and his companions saw the blinded giant walking in the sea and tending to his wound. He used a tall pine tree trunk as a walking stick. Finally, after a long time and many adventures, Aeneas and his group arrived in Italy at the place that had been shown to them as their destination. The story of the life and adventures of Aeneas as we have described in this and the preview chapters, is a summary of the narrative written by poets in those times. While it should not be considered as a factual account, it deserves special attention because of its beautiful and poetic language which has left a profound and lasting impression on the human mind. As we conclude, Chapter 5 of Aeneas's epic journey, we thank you for your company on this voyage through time. Your presence makes the legends of old resonate even more powerfully today. For those of you eager to continue this adventure, stay tuned for the next chapter, The Landing in Latium, where our hero's destiny inches ever closer in the historical backdrop of 1197 to 1190 BC. To journey forth, simply click on the video popping up on your screen as this one concludes, or find the direct link waiting in the video description below. If you've enjoyed our time together and wish to explore more stories like this, please subscribe to Alexandria. Every like you leave encourages us, and every share extends the reach of these timeless tales to like-minded souls. Until we meet again in the next chapter, we bid you farewell. Thank you for supporting Alexandria, where history is always just a play button away.